Battle Dress by Amy E. Foth, Chapter 9, Friday, 23rd July, 0633. Davis has been beating you all week, gentlemen, Cadet Black said after he formed H Company's black group into two squads for our run. This morning I expect to hear the rest of you returning my cadences, too. I'm not fond of duets. I smiled to myself. PT was easily my favorite part of the day. I looked forward to it even more than I did the meals. Since the middle of last week, when Cadet Barrington had divided H Company into three ability groups for the runs, I had had a great time letting everyone in the black group know how effortless I found the runs, the runs that most of them struggled to finish by calling cadences louder than anyone else, and because I was the only girl of about 20 guys, Cadet Black had had a great time, too, rubbing it in. Now I know the pace isn't too fast. Nobody's here by accident. Each and every one of you ran under 13 minutes on last week's PT test, correct? Yes, sir! Okay, then. A 6.30 pace isn't too fast. He crossed his arms. So I can't think of a good reason why you're not sounding off, can you? No, sir. You're not like the common riffraff in the gray group or the lead butts in the gold group. You're the black group, no pun intended, because you're H Company's top runners. You need a challenge and it's my job to give it to you. Okay, time to step down from my bully pulpit. Today we're going to do my famous chapel run. I heard a soft groan sweep through the squads. I remembered our long hot climb up to the chapel last week and I almost groaned myself. It was a tough hill. I'd have to work extra hard to keep up my reputation. It'll take us up to the chapel, past Lusk Reservoir and Mitchie Stadium, then down the nice long hill to Thayer Gate. From there, I'll release you to run the last mile back to the barracks on your own. He glanced at me. As fast as you want. The finish is at Eisenhower Statue. And don't worry about getting lost, he smirked. Just look for me at your front, fourth class, because I'll be there. He stood directly in front of me and said, No one's going to beat me to Eisenhower Statue. I stared at the ground between my feet. It was a challenge. We'll see about that, sir. Hey, Andy, Bogoslavsky whispered behind me. Take it easy on us mortals, okay? I stretched my arms over my head and smiled. I was glad that McGill and Bogoslavsky were in the black group with me. The looks that I got from some of the other black group guys weren't the friendliest at times, especially when we were running up a hill and I was the only one with enough wind for sounding off. But Jason and Kit's presence was comforting. We were the only third squad new cadets who were fast enough for H Company's black group, and even though I was a girl, I knew that they were glad to have me here. At least they acted like it. McGill glanced over at Cadet Black, now sitting on the ground and stretching his calves. You gonna take Cadet Black up on his challenge? I pretended innocence. Challenge? He looked back at Cadet Black again. You know, when he releases us to run back on our own. You gonna smoke him? I raised an eyebrow. We'll see. 0710. Cadet Black had pushed me. Hard. That last stretch of Thayer Road along the Hudson. But the real race began as soon as the barracks were in sight. As we tore down the corridor of towering granite buildings toward the plain. I felt myself easing away from him. He fell back one stride, then two. When Eisenhower's statue was about a hundred yards straight ahead, I knew I had him beat. My body geared up for the final surge. And then I looked back. Cadet Black was there, a good 15 feet behind me, head back, a grimace wringing his face, arms and legs pumping. Seeing him straining so hard, my desire to beat him dissolved. Instantly, I realized that it was one thing for me to beat my peers, that Cadet Black found it amusing. It was a joke we shared, but I wasn't sure he'd be so amused if I beat him, too. I knew a delicate balance exists between impressing someone and threatening someone, and I'd learned a long time ago that threatened people could turn ugly just like that. So at the last second I made the decision, I'd save his ego a thrashing. I held myself back, and we finished together. When we had trotted to a stop, Cadet Black threw back his head and laughed. He raised his right hand and shouted, "'Put it here, Davis!' I hid my smile and returned his high five. Man, Davis, he said, walking in circles with his hands behind his head. You can run. You ever lose a race? I just did, sir. He looked at me knowingly. Yeah, right. Then he shook his head. You sure are something else, Davis. The army team's gonna love you. I grinned at him. I couldn't help myself. I felt too good. He frowned. Smirk off, Davis. You know better than that. But as he turned to watch the rest of the black group come in, I saw his lips twitch. It's gonna be a great day. 1405. What's the spirit of the bayonet? To kill, sir! From where he stood in the center of the PT stand, an upperclassman with more muscles than Superman glowered down at H Company. Stretched across his biceps and pecs was a yellow t-shirt with a dagger and the word bayonet emblazoned on the front. We stood straight and still before him, like rows of camouflage dominoes, our M16s in our hands. The upperclassman raised his M16 over his head with one hand as if it were a mere wiffle ball bat and roared again. What makes the grass grow? Blood makes the grass grow, sir! We yelled, our voices rising in the heavy air. That's right, hardcore. Thick red blood makes the grass grow green. You got a motto here, hardcore? Yes, sir. Let's hear it. We took in one huge collective breath before we shouted. Hardcore H, best by test. We don't care who's second best. We're rough, we're tough, we go all night. We shoot to kill with all our might. Drive on, hardcore, drive on, sir. All right, 
Today, Hardcore, you're going to learn the meaning of those motivating words. Fix bayonets. hoo I slam my M16 on the ground between my feet, and with all the other H Company new cadets, snap my sheath bayonet onto the end of my weapon. Before marching out here to Clinton Field, I'd spent the entire morning cooped up in a silent auditorium with a number two pencil, a booklet of multiple choice questions, and hundreds of other new cadets. After that, lunch, with my hands in my lap and my eyes on my plate. But now that we were finally out here, I was psyched. Yelling and stabbing imaginary bodies and acting crazy was exactly what I needed. Nothing got the blood pumping better than a good session of bayonet drills. Ready, stance, move! Together, we brought our M16s diagonally across our chest and stood poised for action with our legs flexed like a quarterback at the line of scrimmage, ready for the ball. Butt stroke to the head! Move! hoo I took a giant step forward and slammed the butt of my weapon upward, as if I were smashing an imaginary enemy soldier in the face. Slash series to the chest! Move! hoo I stepped forward again, slicing the space in front of me diagonally from left to right. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Cadet Daly moving his way down my rank. He leaned into each third squad new cadet as he passed, yelling something about blood and guts and killing. The sun poured out of a cloudless sky. Sweat oozed from every pore of my body. My weapon was slick with it. I felt great. What's the spirit of the bayonet? The upperclassman bellowed again. Cadet Daly was getting closer. I gripped my weapon harder and stuck the most murderous, bloodthirsty look on my face that I could muster. To kill, sir! Smash series to the knee! Move! hoo As I took out my imaginary opponent's knee with one barbaric stroke of my M16, I screamed louder than I had all day, hoping Cadet Daly would hear me and be impressed. Okay, get ready. Here he comes. My heart started to beat faster. Thrust! hoo I lunged forward to skewer my invisible enemy and... No! My M16 flew out of my hands and clattered to the ground, just missing the new cadet in the rank in front of me. Cadet Daly was in my face before I could even move to pick it up. Davis, what are you doing? Are you spazzing out on me? No, sir. No, he roared. I licked my lips and tasted salt. So much for impressing him. Smash series to the head. Move, yelled the muscle-bound upperclassman. I moved for my M16. I'm not through with you, Davis. You trying to blow me off? I jumped back. No, sir. Sweat trickled down my back. I swallowed. My mouth felt dry and pasty, like I'd been sucking on a glue stick. Drop. I stared at him. Push-ups? Now? But what about my M16? The rest of H Company were now bashing the air with the butts of their weapons and screamed for blood, except me. I said, drop, Davis. Now move! New cadets everywhere were stealing sidelong glances at us. I knelt in the grass and got into the leaning rest. The muscles in my arms quivered. The commands came fast and furious from the PT stand, and battle cries ripped from the throats of my classmates in frenzied response. Cadet Daly bent over me and shouted above the noise, Low crawl over to your weapon and secure it, and don't take all day. Move out! low crawl here in front of everyone but i had to obey i plunged to the ground and slithered on my elbows and knees over the 10 feet of grass to my weapon as fast as i could i was mortified i had become more than just a distraction i was a one woman vaudeville show with cadet daly as its director producer choreographer and prop man and right now i hated him for it it reminded me of the times my mother had humiliated me in front of my teammates after track practice barging into the girls' locker room and calling me names that prison guards reserved for their worst inmates, because I had made her wait for me in the parking lot a few minutes longer than we had arranged. I crawled back to Cadet Daly, dragging my M16 and stopped at his feet. Now get back into the leaning rest and knock him out till I get tired, he shouted. Hold on to your weapon at all times, Davis, and after each repetition I want to hear, I will not drop my weapon. Execute! I hesitated, staring at my M16. How in the world can I hold my weapon and do push-ups? Today, Davis, today. I told you to do push-ups on your weapon, not to kiss it. I wound the sling around one hand and then the other, pulling my weapon to lie over both. Then I lowered my chest toward the ground and pushed myself back up. I will not drop my weapon. Louder! And get your gut off the ground. I did another push-up, trying hard not to sag. I will not drop my weapon! I clenched my teeth. Jerk. It's not like I did it on purpose or something. Whirl! Commanded Mr. Muscles from the PT stand. I will not drop my weapon! I kept squeezing out push-ups one by one, gasping and grunting, and trying to ignore all the slashing and stabbing around me. The grass beneath me grew slippery with my sweat, and my arms became so tired I could barely go down at all. On your feet, Cadet Daly said at last. I'm tired, Davis. Tired of watching your miserable carcass writhing around on the ground. I sank to my knees and staggered to my feet, using my M16 as a crutch. Treat your weapon like a boyfriend, Davis. Respect it. Care for it. Develop a meaningful relationship with it. I felt my face burn. Not from the sun overhead. I didn't know the first thing about how to treat a guy, and he probably knew it too. Never abuse it. It may save your life someday. Be faithful to it, and it'll be faithful to you. Cadet Daly turned around, and I resumed the ready stance. Butt stroke to the groin! Move! I gritted my teeth, and taking a giant step forward, I drove the butt of my weapon upward, with one particular enemy soldier in mind. Hua! 15-20. When bayonet drills were over, Cadet Daly gave us 30 minutes of free time. 
Well, sort of. We were to use the time to turn in our M16s, check our mail, change into fresh brown t-shirts and spet shine boots, drink a canteen of water, write a letter home, and get into battle dress under arms, pistol belt, bayonet, full canteen, white gloves, and M14 rifles, cleaned for drill. Any time remaining after accomplishing all that would be considered our free time. A few minutes after we had turned our M16s into the weapons room and had visited the mail room, Gabrielle and I were at our desks, sitting in fresh brown t-shirts and chugging water from our canteens. I'm so hot, Gabrielle said between gulps. I can't stop sweating. This t-shirt is almost as soaked as the one I just took off. And look, she walked over to me and lifted the bangs away from her forehead. I'm breaking out all over the place. I have more red on my face than on top of my head. It's not that bad, Gab. I put my drained canteen on my desk and started fanning myself with my four pieces of mail. Gabrielle exaggerated everything. Easy for you to say. She yanked her bun out of her hair and sank back into her chair. You don't have any. You sweat like a beast but never get zits. It's not fair. Talking about my looks made me uncomfortable. It reminded me of my mother. She loved to comment on my looks too, but never in a remotely positive way. I changed the subject. So, did you get any mail? Yeah, a letter from my mom and dad and one from Sherry. She smiled, holding it up. I've told you about Sherry, haven't I? My best friend? Yeah. I felt a little stab of pain. What about me? I glanced over at Gabrielle. She had already ripped open the envelope and was reading the letter with a huge grin on her face, raking her fingers through her damp hair. I turned away and looked at the four letters in my hand, feeling stupid. Of course you're not Gabrielle's best friend. I knew that those few nights we managed to stay awake after taps whispering about home and guys and West Point fears couldn't compete with years of friendship, years full of slumber parties and shopping trips, phone calls that lasted half the night, and ditching class just to hang out. Things I never did. Life in my house was totally incompatible with having a best friend, so I never had one. Gabrielle giggled and slid the letter into the top drawer of her desk. Sherry's great. She writes the best letters. She's getting ready to leave for school at the University of Pennsylvania, but it's not like she's going away away. I mean, she lives just a few streets from me in Philadelphia, you know. Yeah, I remember. You told me. We had it all planned, Sherry and me. We were going to be roommates. I was going to play tennis for Penn, and I nodded. Oh yeah, you got recruited there too. I started picking up one of my envelopes. Listening to her talk about Sherry made me feel strange inside, but I couldn't name the emotion. I felt insignificant and intimidated and a little bit jealous all mixed together. You'll just have to meet her sometime, Andy. You'd love her. I sorted through my letters. Two from my mom, one from my sister, and one from a credit card company with big print on the outside saying I was pre-approved for a $3,000 credit limit. Gabrielle pulled her second letter from its envelope. Sherry might be coming up with my parents at the end of the summer. You know that day Cadet Daly told us about? After Beast when we can spend the whole day with our parents? Yeah, maybe I can meet her then. I had no idea if my own parents were going to come. I wasn't even sure if I wanted them to, but there was one thing I did know. Just the thought of introducing them to Gabrielle made me sweat. I pulled out the letter from my mom, the one with the oldest postmark. Dear Andy, finally you wrote. We were making up our minds if we should come all the way to West Point at the end of the summer. It is a thousand miles, you know. When you never bother to write, it doesn't make me feel like we should bother to come. Next week is Randy's birthday. He will be 13. A teenager already. We're going to have a nice party for him, but only family. I don't want any of his bratty friends around. That ugly skinny boy from your running team came over the other day. The one that asked you on dates, but you were smart enough to avoid like the plague. He came over to hear how you're doing. He's a nice boy, but nothing special. You should find one of those West Point boys. They are a much higher caliber, and smarter too. You wrote that you made the running team. That's crazy. You won't have time for running in college. You don't even get a grade for it, do you? But you never listen. You'll run yourself right out of West Point, you'll see. And for what? You should join the band. We spent all that money on that clarinet and all those years of lessons. That would be more productive than running, that's for sure. Do you eat and sleep enough? Right, okay? It's not easy when your kids go away. I told you I'd write you every day, didn't I? And I have kept that promise. How many other mothers write every day? Love, Mom. I didn't know which I wanted to do more, scream or cry. What did you expect? Something nice and encouraging? I looked back in the envelope for a note from my dad. Nothing. Typical. I dumped the letter in the trash can and stashed my mother's second one in my desk without opening it. Then I opened the letter for my sister. Dear Andy, congrats on making the cross-country team. Mom thought it was stupid and Dad said nothing as usual, but I think it's great. I can't wait to tell Coach Wolf. He'll be so excited. Things are about the same as always. I went to the library almost every day this week. It's too hot to stay in the house. Mom won't run the AC when Dad's at work. Plus, Mom's been in a really bad mood since we got back from West Point. I think it's because you're gone, but you know me. I just stay out of her way. Five more weeks till school and counting. I know you have enough junk to worry about, but I thought you should know that last week, Dad moved all the stuff out of your room and put it down in the basement. I guess since you're not living here anymore, he figured he'd use your room for an office. He said when you come home for Christmas, you can sleep on the couch downstairs. Unless he's on it, of course. Anyway, when they were moving your stuff, Mom found one of your diaries and, of course, read it, then ripped it up in a million pieces. 
I guess she didn't like how she was portrayed in it, so it's gone. So are all your race trophies. I was able to hide the one you won at sectionals last year, though, before she got to it. Your boss from the Y called and asked how you're doing. That's about all the excitement from here. Miss you. Love, Amanda. I laid my head down on my desk. Could this day get any worse? I walked over to the trash can and shredded the letter. Then I walked back to my desk, yanked open the top drawer, grabbed the unopened letter from my mother, returned to the trash can and shredded it too. Gabrielle was watching me. Do you always destroy your letters? I shrugged and started putting on my boots. I didn't feel like talking right now, to her or anyone. I could actually feel the silence in the room. Gabrielle finished lacing her boots, then walked over to her wardrobe closet and started rummaging around. Uh, Andy, she finally said. I'm going to fill my canteen with the cold water from the drinking fountain. You know how I hate tepid water. If you want, I'll fill yours too. I quickly wiped any trace of tears out of the corners of my eyes and looked at her over my shoulder. Thanks, Gab. My canteen's on my desk. I smiled a little. I still have to write that letter home. That was the last thing I wanted to do, but it was an order, and Cadet Daly would check. I know my nose was red. It always got red when I tried not to cry. But Gabrielle didn't notice, or pretended not to. She snapped her pistol belt around her waist and got my canteen from my desk. We only have, like, she checked her watch, four minutes to be on Daly's wall, you know. Yeah, I'll keep the letter short and sweet. Real short. When Gabrielle had left, I pulled a piece of paper and a matching envelope from my box of West Point issued stationery, grabbed a pen and scribbled, Dear everyone, I'm still here. Love, Andy. 1705. Davis, what is your major malfunction? Once again, Cadet Daly stood inches from my face. I stared at the gold West Point crest on his black plastic helmet, so I wouldn't have to look in his eyes. The rest of Third Squad is squared away. Look at me, Davis, when I'm talking to you. Yes, sir. I stared at his green eyes and chewed on the inside of my lip, trying to think of pleasant things. You like being the weak link of the chain, Davis? No, sir, I croaked. Third Squad had spent the past hour roasting under the afternoon sun while practicing the manual of arms, a series of complicated movements with M14s, done in perfect unison and snappy precision. Movements tricky enough for right-handed new cadets to master, but almost impossible for someone left-handed like me. I might as well have been manipulating the M14 with my feet, as coordinated as I felt. Cadet Daly stepped away from me and rubbed the back of his neck. The black helmet on his head and the saber hanging from his waist reflected the blazing sun overhead as he paced before us. As you know, Third Squad, drill competition is next week. As you also know, Third Squad, H Company has won the Cadet Basic Training Drill Steamer Award for the past three years. We intend to continue our tradition of excellence. I will not, I repeat, will not allow my squad to hold H Company back. H Company has a reputation to protect. Do I make myself clear, Third Squad? Yes, sir. And I will not, read my lips, will not allow any bonehead to make Third Squad look bad. I have a reputation to protect, he glared at me. Do I make myself clear, Davis? Yes, sir. He stepped in front of me. Glad to hear it. Continue to rest in place, Third Squad, while I give Davis here a little of my undivided attention. Davis, attention! I snapped to attention, holding my rifle flush against my right leg and my left arm at my side. Cadet Daly moved closer, silently studying my face. I held my breath, the pulse in my temples pounding out the seconds. Finally, he dropped his gaze to my feet. Why isn't the butt of your weapon in line with the toe of your boot? No excuse, sir. Make the correction. This is basic stuff, Davis. Yes, sir. I looked down at my feet. It's only off a half inch. What's his problem? Attention to detail, Davis. Sloppy soldiers get troops killed. Right shoulder arms! Right shoulder arms. From the ground to your shoulder in four steps. I can do this. I took a deep breath. 1001. I snapped the M14 up and across my body with my right hand. At the same time, I crossed my left arm under my right, catching the center of the rifle. 1002. I jerked my right hand, uncrossing my arms to hold the butt of the rifle in the palm of my hand. So far, so good. Now for the hard part. 1003. I flipped the M14 around 90 degrees and winced, anticipating the barrel slamming into my right shoulder. With my left hand, I guided the rifle further up my shoulder. Cease work, Davis. You will keep all inappropriate face contortions to yourself. You are a military machine. You are not paid to feel. His eyes left my face. And what is that? He pointed to my left hand. The fingers of your left hand should be extended and joined, with your palm facing your body. Like a salute, Davis. Easy stuff. And the first joint of your index finger should be touching the rear of the receiver group. The what? What is he talking about? My throat was aching, throbbing. I felt like it would burst. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Now look at your weapon, Davis. I directed my eyes downward. It's canted. No, not merely canted, Davis. It's practically laying flat against your chest. This movement's called right shoulder arms for a reason. The brown wood of the handguard and the black steel of the barrel blurred into the camouflage patterns of my shirt. I blinked. This is unacceptable, Davis. Order arms. I shakily brought my weapon down to my side. Do it again, Davis. Right shoulder arms. Cadet Daly stopped me before I even got the rifle halfway across my body. Order arms! Do it again! Over and over he shouted those two commands. Right shoulder arms and order arms. 
With my every mistake, he grew more incensed, and with his every correction, I became more flustered until his face was red and my body shook. What is your problem, Davis? I have been holding your hand for the past ten minutes, taking you by the numbers through something that you should already know by now, and all I have to show for it is a migraine headache and a squad of thirsty boneheads. He put his hands on his hips and said with disgust, What do you have to say for yourself, Davis? My lips were trembling. I pressed them together and swallowed. No excuse, sir. That's right, Davis. There is no excuse for your pitiful performance today. Then barely above a whisper, he snarled. Well, I have something to say. I'm profoundly disappointed in you, Davis. His words opened wounds that a bayonet never could. I took a deep breath, trying to quell my frustration and shame, rage and pain from exploding all over my face. Tell him about being left-handed. Then he'll understand this isn't my fault and take it back. Sir, may I make a statement? I blurted. What? He snapped. Sir, I'm left-handed. What did you say, Davis? It had been exactly the wrong thing to say, but I'd said it. I couldn't take it back now. Sir, my voice caught. I said I'm left-handed. Silence. Silence and more silence. Finally, Cadet Daly spoke with terrifying calmness. Third squad, attention! Be on my wall in ten minutes before dinner formation. This training session is over. Then he opened his mouth and roared, POST! In unison, third squad with new Cadet Sierra leading the way scurried in single file for the nearest sally port and pounded up the stairs. Gabrielle was in front of me. In my hurry to get to my room, I was afraid I'd plow right over her. And then I heard his voice filling the stairwell. Your history, Davis! He bounded up the stairs, two at a time. What about it, Davis? Ready to kiss this place goodbye? He shadowed me up the flight of stairs, across the landing, then up the next. What was I thinking? I had to open my big mouth and brought this on myself. Want to pack your bags and call home to your mama? I clenched my teeth and willed my eyes to stare dead ahead. Do not look at him. But I could see him out of the corner of my eye. His twisted lips and his red face and those stupid bulging veins. You can tell her you couldn't hack West Point because you're left-handed? I had now reached the third floor and my hallway. I checked the room numbers 311, 310... Gabrielle was moving out, along the wall in front of me, as if she were trying to keep Cadet Daly's rage from engulfing her too. Poor, poor new Cadet Davis, he whined in a mocking voice. Being left-handed is so unfair. And to think, Napoleon was left-handed too. I could feel his breath on my face, he was so close. Make my day, Davis. Let's see some big, fat, salty tears. 309, 308. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Too proud to cry, Davis? Is that it? Come on, prove what everyone already thinks about you. 307, 306, faster gab, that you're weak, Davis, and you don't got what it takes to make it here. I felt like I had been shocked with a thousand volts. It was Cadet Daly's voice, but my mother's words. That's not true. I do have what it takes. I do. You don't know anything about me. I felt that stubborn crybaby lump again, throbbing so hard in my throat that my teeth ached. 305, Gabrielle darted across the hall for our room. Bang. She flung the door open and scurried inside. Seconds later, I crossed the threshold and, bang, I slammed the door behind me. Gabrielle gasped. I looked back at her with horror. Did I really do that? I was dead. Boom! The door flew back open, sending our trash can rattling across the floor and leaving a trail of shredded paper behind. Cadet Daly filled the doorway. Enter, sir, Gabrielle squeaked in a voice an octave higher than normal. I already have, he said between clenched teeth, his eyes boring into me. Miss Brian, he hissed barely above a whisper. Post. I want to talk to Davis. Alone. Yes, sir. She placed her M14 in her weapons rack and bolted out the door. The latrine. That's where I would go. It's a great place to hide. Cadet Daly stared at me. I tried to stare back just as furiously, but my vision was blurred and my lips were trembling so violently that no amount of lip biting could stop them. Then his expression softened. Sit down, Davis, he said, nodding toward my bed. That trace of compassion was enough to break the little resolve I had left. I collapsed onto my bed, and those big, fat, salty tears that Cadet Daly had hoped for came, fast, with gasping sobs. He walked slowly toward me, took my rifle from my hands, and put it in the slot of the weapons rack. Then he pulled my chair over to the side of my bed and sat down facing me. All right, Davis, what's up? Sir, I don't want to be here, I said between sobs. There, I'd said it. Now everyone would be happy. Cadet Daly, my mother, especially my mother. Yes, you do, Davis. No, sir, I don't, I gasped. Homesick? I shook my head from side to side. No, sir, it's too much like home. Cadet Daly stood up. He walked to my window and looked outside, rubbing the back of his neck. Calm down, calm down, you look like a fool. Still looking out the window, Cadet Daly said, That's fine, Davis. Leave. And every day for the rest of your life, you'll look in the mirror and hate yourself. He spun around and his anger was back. Listen to me, Davis. Four years from now, worthless trash like Miss Offenbacher will march into Mitchie Stadium, collect her diploma from the President of the United States, and become a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And where will you be? One insignificant name among thousands on a list of graduates from some no-name institution? Is that what you want, Davis? Knowing what you could have been? 
but sir, I can't do anything right here. I let out a huge involuntary sob. I'm the weak link in the chain. He turned away from me and faced the window again to let me cry. I'm, I'm not crying because I'm sad or anything, sir. I just, just hate when I can't do something right. Don't worry about it, Davis. No one leaves this place without crying at least once. I sniffed. You said that I don't have what it takes, and everybody thinks so. I don't think that, Davis, Cadet Daly said, now leaning against the window ledge. But you said that you were disappointed in me. I was. He stomped away from the window and sat back down in the chair. You were sloppy and unmotivated. That's not typical Davis behavior. Yeah, I was disappointed in you. He pulled off his white gloves and shoved them into his black plastic helmet. Look, Davis, I think you have what it takes. I know you're head and shoulders above most of your knucklehead classmates in H Company. I wouldn't waste my time with you if I didn't think so. I'd dog your butt until you broke, then FedEx the pieces to your front door. But you, Miss Andrea Davis from Lake Zurich, Illinois, you have to believe that you have what it takes. I wiped my tears on my white gloves that I clutched in my hands. Nobody had ever told me that I had anything before. I was always stupid and ugly and ungrateful. I sniffed again and tugged at the tag inside of my gloves. Size four. You have the raw materials. Brains, talent, drive. But that's not enough to make it through this place. A thousand kids walked through Thayer Gate four weeks ago with the same stuff that you have. But guess what? Not all of them are here today. And you know why? Because this place is hard, Davis. It takes more than a high SAT score and a varsity letter. It takes self-discipline. Not the rules that West Point puts on you, but the rules you put on yourself. That's what character is all about. Slamming doors when you're mad isn't self-discipline. Making excuses for poor performance even when they're true isn't self-discipline. Feeling sorry for yourself isn't self-discipline. Yes, sir. I started to feel a little better. This place, I realized, wasn't anything like home. Here, all the name-calling and yelling had a purpose. A purpose aimed to give us character, not to hurt us. I can't imagine you being a quitter, Davis. But if that's what you want, I can't make you stay. But I can make you think about it. He checked his watch and stood up, his helmet under his arm. All right, enough said. Police up your roommate. You've got 20 minutes to be on my wall in white over gray. Then he smiled, and it wasn't a nasty smile. Drive on, hardcore. I watched him walk up my door, feeling as if a 50-pound ruck had been lifted off my back. The day I'd leave West Point would be the day I collected my diploma from the President of the United States. I had no other choice, and I had found the fact strangely comforting. I opened my mouth and yelled, Never surrender, sir! That's right, Davis. I heard Cadet Daly answer from somewhere in the hallway, Never surrender.